today and how out of World War I comes all these confrontations that are happening today. Our speaker, Ingo Schmidt, uh, wants to be known as a working class economist, but he also teaches uh, at the University of Athabasca in their uh, labor studies. And he will be the, give the introduction address. Now, um, this year our theme is, uh, as you of course know, imperialism, resistance and alternatives 100 years after uh, the start of World War I. Um, and in the past we had discussions uh, why we are doing this historical stuff, why we look at things uh, that happened way back when, when the point is not to interpret the world but to change it. Mm -hmm. um, and um, of course uh, I also know and we as organizers know uh, that uh, many of you and others uh, are not too fond of history. And uh, those of you who are good citizens, you also know that history cannot matter very much because your prime minister uh, put the historical archives of Canada on the chopping block. <laughs> However, the same prime minister uh, is very uh, good at using history for his political purposes uh, and also for the purposes of the people standing behind this prime minister. And the same is true, obviously, for ruling uh, classes in other countries who are also happy to refer back to history when it suits their political purposes. For example, justifying the wars they are engaged in today, and those are the wars we are fighting against, uh, quite obviously. And uh, this being 2014, uh, the most handy thing to do was to justify today's wars, or many of them, with a reference to World War I which uh, started 100 years ago. And I was uh, looking around a little bit and found actually th three th major themes uh, seem to kind of uh, come out of those efforts of uh, justifying today's world with reference to the past, to 1914. Uh, one I uh, would call, it actually is openly called sleepwalking. The other justification about going to war is we learned our lessons well. And the third one is birth of a nation. Now, this uh, sleepwalking, those of you who did pay attention to British and world history in school, or might have uh, just done a Google check, uh, will find out two things. There was an um, English prime minister, jo uh, Lloyd George, who in 1920, looking back at World War I, said, well, we were kind of sleepwalking into it. We didn't really know uh, what was going on and we didn't really know what we were doing either. And this notion of sleepwalking was picked up by an Australian historian who wrote a bestseller uh, about the sleepwalkers. His name is Christopher Clark. And the book uh, came out very timely, uh, two or three years, I can't recall exactly, uh, prior to 2014. Uh, and it set the tone and many people would uh, pick it up and say, yeah, we were re they were really sleepwalking into the war. Now that's of course a very apologetic uh, idea, uh, kind of trying to justify what they have done in terms of uh, industrialized manslaughter by saying, well, if we had known in advance, uh, maybe we wouldn't have done it. Obviously that is a lie uh, to some extent because the plans were all ready to go um, as became quite obvious from July to early August 1914. Uh, so obviously there were some people in the ruling classes then who wanted to go to war and uh, had just waited for the chance to do so. On the other hand, I think uh, there is a, a grain of truth in this notion of sleepwalking because uh, those who sent the soldiers to war where they ended up in the trenches uh, very uh, soon, they didn't really expect the kind of industrial manslaughter that actually happened. What we can draw from that, I would argue, is not, not to say, well, sometimes you make mistakes uh, and you have to live with that. What uh, we can draw from that, I would argue, is, well, that if people uh, at the top are not knowing what they do, then it's better not to have people at the top uh, and uh, cut radically their decision-making powers. Now the second justification to go to war, we learned our lessons so well, 
That is particularly uh, popular in Europe, where in World War I, uh, a significant, I think, uh, if I've done my stats right, uh, most of the fighting and dying has been done. Uh, in the Second World War, this uh, has shifted uh, to a significant degree to Asia. But in uh, World War I, it was largely uh, in Europe, and so European leaders these days uh, are full of themselves saying, we learned the lesson, this was so awful, and it's not supposed to happen again. Well, that sounds very good, uh, and uh, Europe uh, takes pride in being such a peaceful area, unless on the territory that's known as uh, Europe, there are rogue states like U Yugoslavia, then they have to be bombed, uh, unless uh, Ukraine, where you don't know exactly whether this is Europe or Asia, you know, Europeans never know where uh, their little continent starts and where it ends. <coughs> then it's quite handy to say, we learned our lesson so well, uh, and to make sure it won't happen again, we have to stop all those bastards who do not play by our role. Um, I guess that's the most cynical use um, of uh, lessons uh, to be learned from a war, uh, saying we do it, uh, we learned from it so well, and we have to do it again so that others won't do it uh, in the future. Uh, this is the true meaning of uh, bringing democracy and peace to other parts of the world. Now the third idea, justification for wars today is birth of a nation, and that's very popular in what has been the dominions, for example, Canada, Australia, or notably uh, Australia and uh, Canada, and which is uh, not as hypocritical as the European version saying, we learned how awful war is, so we have to do it again to stop it in the future. Uh, it's openly <coughs> said uh, by Stephen Harper uh, and his buddy, and Australia is uh, also um, has moved uh, very strongly to a very aggressive foreign policy, very militarized, <coughs> uh, is our nation comes out of war, and to honor the dead, we have to kill people uh, today. Uh, well, from a human rights point, uh, point of view, you might say that's uh, pretty <coughs> cynical also. Now, I assume uh, if you come out on a Saturday morning to a peace forum teach, and you're really more interested in stopping war today and in the future uh, than, about, uh, than hearing about history, uh, so if you reject wars and injustices around the world, <coughs> what do we do with our imperialism, resistance, and alternatives? I would argue we have to know what imperialism looked like then in order to understand how it looks like now. And that allows us to draw lessons from the resistance that was put up in the past in order to inform and guide our resistance today. Um, and uh, of course, this is closely tied in with the idea that the resistance also has a goal, has an aim, and uh, that is uh, changing the world for the better, uh, that is looking for alternatives to the imperialist and capitalist world we are living in today. Now, in 1914, the world looked different uh, in many ways uh, from what it looks uh, today, the world was ruled by European colonial powers. Um, there was no doubt they were in the driver's seat and they had their quabbles with, with each other and that's uh, what they went to war about. Today that's very different. Uh, it's hard to imagine these days uh, that Germany would uh, declare war on France and uh, England would then declare war on Germany, etc., etc that this imperialist chain would fall apart so that the imperialist power would, powers would uh, fight each other. Uh, everybody knows the name <coughs> of the uh, guy who is in the driver's uh, seat uh, these days uh, and has been in that position for a long time. Uh, it's our neighbor, Uncle Sam, uh, and all the other imperialist powers are quite happy to line up behind uh, Uncle Sam, uh, whether it's Canada, whether it's the European countries, whether it's Japan. There's a little bit of uh, questioning uh, what to do about these funny, uh, highly populated uh, countries uh, with lower per capita incomes than the Western countries. Uh, I'm speaking about Brazil, Russia, India, and uh, China. 
uh, sometimes lumped together as the BRICS, uh, whether they are a challenge uh, to US leadership and Western dominance in general, or whether they are also just keen to line up <coughs> behind Uncle Sam uh, like so many others did. Now the world also looks very different uh, in another way. In 1914, a process of uh, sending troops overseas set up a flag and hope this will lead to good business. Uh, establishing markets was the predominant form of the colonization of the world. Uh, and often economically, uh, it wasn't good business uh, unless uh, uh, just for the people who made the fabric for the flags uh, and the arms uh, to uh, uh, screw and suppress the peoples of the world. <clears throat> That's different uh, today. Nobody really cares about the flag uh, unless you have to uh, instigate war, then you have to stir up some nationalist uh, sentiments. But if you're a good business person, you do not uh, care about national flags. Uh, and you don't have necessarily have to go overseas. Today it's about uh, turning everything into a commodity no matter where you find it whether it's, for example, Simon Fraser University, uh, public uh, institution, uh, you bet, uh, can be turned into a commodity just like the human body, I have a kidney to offer, uh, and many other things. That's the um, <coughs> uh, capitalist world of today, and of course it is global and it is <coughs> uh, dominated by Western countries. What also has changed significantly is of course uh, there's capitalism, where you have capitalism, you have working classes, somebody has to uh, produce the profits for the happy few, but these working classes have changed beyond uh, recognition over the last 100 years. <coughs> 100 years ago, you had industrial working classes almost exclu no, exclusively in the Western industrial centers who were also the colonial powers. Um, and that's where these images of marching columns of workers uh, lining up behind the red flag came from. They are a bit of a satirical thing, of course, because the majority of workers uh, never worked in these gigantic uh, uh, factories uh, where they could uh, form huge columns. Uh, most worked in small enterprises. Be that as it may, most workers of the world, uh, industrial workers of the world, were concentrated in the rich countries way back when. This has changed dramatically Finding an industrial worker in a rich country these days uh, is like uh, winning the lottery. Uh, it uh, happens very rarely. China, as uh, you probably have heard, has become the workshop of the world, just unlike the time when England was the workshop of the world and eventually British workers managed to struggle for higher wages it's, uh, and uh, reach some kind of social compromise with uh, the capitalists. Uh, it's uh, quite uh, questionable whether the workers in China and other countries of the South will ever be in that uh, position. What is important here is, uh, speaking at the Peace Forum teach-in, that war also <coughs> has changed considerably over the last 100 years. Um, the marching columns of workers uh, that I already mentioned, uh, of which uh, leaders of the Second International, uh, all good <coughs> socialists, uh, so they thought, um, were lining up behind the red flag. Ruling classes at the time figured, well, maybe we can uh, get these uh, guys into marching columns more easily behind national flags. And that's where the industrial manslaughter uh, actually happened. Uh, 